Hi, it's Brent here with Theoretically Practical. Uh, you probably can see my breath. It's super warm out in the shop today, a solid six degrees or so. Um, this is the final episode on, well, maybe it'll be a follow-up or something, but this is the final episode on the Hoskamp CP300 uh, three-phase, single-phase welder conversion. Uh, I've learned a lot since the last video, um, and uh, we'll talk about it. So uh, here's the welder, we'll get, we'll get to that. And we've gone back to uh, the 200 volt tap. So we'll go through what that actually looks like in person. So uh, remember, the important thing is in the previous videos, there were two jumpers on the back connecting all three uh, phases together. And that is now gone. Um, and that has to be removed. The other thing is in the last video, I, I talked about where the, where the uh, fan needs to hook up. And what I did is I, I clipped the fan leads. You can see one right there and one right there. But what I figured out was that underneath these yellow boots uh, is a spade terminal. So instead of wiring them to either the inputs, which would always be live, so you don't wanna do that, um, or the board here, for the sake of cleanliness, I took them and I disconnected them and I wired them to the switch, which you can see right there. So they're just connected to the two input phases of the switch. This side of the switch is always live, that side of the switch is switched. So that's why I put them there. Now they're sort of out of the way. Uh, it's nice, it's clean and tidy, and it means that also if I ever want to reconfigure it or play around with stuff, I, they're, they're dealt with, because it's only gonna be single phase. You'll see that there is a jumper one, two, three, and they're just big U-shaped jumpers. And uh, there'll be a Granger part number below. Uh, they're, uh, they're wire lugs. I like them, they, they seem to work really well. So you're gonna jumper those three together, and that's only for the CP300s or possibly the CP200s that are new enough to have the 200 volt taps. Uh, this also means that the, the way I have it set up now, the front indicator will be true to the no load voltage. So that's the other thing that's confusing about this. You might turn it to 25 volts and you put a heavy load on it and you're actually seeing 23 or 24. The no load volts is what's displayed on the front. So you will have to play with your settings a little bit to, uh, to get it to match. Like let's say I use the Miller calculator on their webpage, it's really good. You just select uh, what you're trying to do and it tells you the uh, voltage, the wire speed, the type of gas you're using, uh, which, you know, the 7525, uh, and it also tells you what the amperage should be. So you can kind of fiddle with those and, and get it figured out. So you've got your input phases right here. There's the yellow for the one phase, the red for the other phase. That on the front is connected to that on the back. So you'll see this jumper and we'll follow it up and over and that feeds the this transformer 180 degrees out of phase with this transformer and then the yellow comes in and it's connected directly to there and that's jumpered down to there to feed that 180 degrees out of phase now the middle phase is powered by the capacitors so you'll see there's the white pair of capacitor wires and the blue pair of capacitor wires um, the order of this and the order of this is irrelevant because you can only drive, you're gonna only be 90 degrees from either how this one is or from this one. It's only gonna go 90 degrees left or right and we'll talk about um, you know, the difference between single phase and three phase and what I mean by 90 and 180 degrees. Um, it'll be graphed, it'll be pretty simple. So these are for your capacitors. So the power for the capacitors goes out here, goes down through here, and because I ended up with enough capacitors and I wanted to have a capacitor bank I could add and subtract to, I went through the thing with um, cord grips or cable glands or whatever you want to call them, and then out to back here. Um, I only have one tank of gas, so this is actually a good spot for them. They will be you know, this will not be wide open to the elements. It'll be wrapped up nicely, and the whole thing will be in a, in a box here. Um, it makes it a little simpler on the wiring, a little easier than stuffing them in the back of the welder, and uh, I, that's the way I think it should be done anyhow for, for me. 
Um, I also like it because if these capacitors go bad, uh, they can explode and because they're oil filled, they can make a mess. If I put them in their own enclosure back here, the chance of them screwing up something inside the system, it just goes away. So um, I would suggest for this size welder um, that you get uh, 10 of these capacitors. They're the Dayton capacitors. They're a 2MEH9C. I think I have some that are just 2MEH9s. I do not know what the C stands for. I don't think it matters. Um, because when you are gonna get this machine to work, and it does finally weld well, when you're gonna get it to weld well, you're going to add the capacitors one at a time. And the way to find out how many capacitors to add is by to weld in thin material. For my experimentation, and uh, if you watched the last video, you saw the waveforms, that means something, but not as much as I thought at the time. Um, what I basically figured out is that you just add two at a time while welding on, in this case, 16 gauge material. And we'll go over and look at my test board, which I welded over and over and over again. And you can see right here, you can add more and more capacitance. And then right there, it'll just flatten out when you have enough capacitance. Now, this is what my test piece was for thicker material. This is quarter inch thick. And uh, you can see that this, this melts in nice. This is much less sensitive uh, to the amount of capacitance uh, than the thin material. So you wanna set up your welder by adding capacitors till the thin material welds properly. So that way you don't need a, an amp meter, you don't need a volt meter, you don't need anything else. Um, which is what I was trying to, to figure out how to get that across uh, without, without a whole bunch of ele extra electrical equipment you may not have. So let's go back to the capacitors now that I've shown that and also hopefully it's uh, my film guy has managed to flip the last scene upside down because I flipped it sideways and then I flipped it again and the GoPro is happy to change the display. I also upgraded to a Hero 9 from a Hero 3 because the Hero 3 was not much of a hero anymore. Um, so the reason why you want the minimum number of capacitors here is because the capacitors will affect the idle draw. So um, let's, let's take a look at that. Um, I gotta go plug the machine in. So we were talking about amperage load at idle. And that's something that's somewhat important. It's more important in industrial setting where you use it all the time, obviously as a home gamer like me, uh, it's important, but not the be all end all. But this welder working correctly is pulling, let's see if I get that down in there, good. I think it's around, I mean, I'm using obviously the cheapest Harbor Freight amp clamp, but uh, it's pulling around 15 amps at idle, uh, which is a lot. which is the magic number. Let's turn it off. All right, and uh, we're also gonna unplug it. And uh, so you guys shouldn't be adding and subtracting these with it plugged in and all that stuff. Be really careful. Um, but we're gonna plug in one more capacitor per leg. So that's one for that leg and one for that leg. Okay, so we'll turn it back on. Everything sounds exactly the same, but look, I'm now pulling 24 amps at idle. And it's interesting because you can basically go to each of these capacitors and each one of the capacitors, this is a 60 microfarad capacitor, is adding about seven amps to the pile six or seven amps. Uh, so what that means is when I was experimenting, I added this and then I actually added the two uh, 
cheap Chinese 130 microfarad capacitors onto it. And what I found out is I was pulling uh, nearly, uh, what, around 40 amps at idle, which the problem with that is that this welder is rated to draw from the power source 30 amps maximum when running on three phase. So what, what ended up happening is the core of the welder gets extremely hot. Uh, and this, this transformer uh, started to smoke a little bit. Now, I think I unplugged it in time not to do any major damage. It doesn't seem like it's affected anything. But uh, this welder, because it's 100% duty cycle and because it's kind of old, doesn't have any thermal protection. It will just burn itself to the ground and to hell with the consequences. So yeah, that's something, that's why you want the minimum amount of capacitors attached. So we're going to go back ahead and we're just going to disconnect... Uh, all right, we're gonna, I can't do it with one hand. I'm gonna go ahead in a minute and disconnect these capacitors. We'll be back to four. Uh, so, and actually I'm gonna disconnect uh, down to two capacitors and we'll go back to the metal plate. We're gonna do some welding and we won't change any settings on the welder in between passes. And you'll be able to immediately tell uh, from the sound, if not from the video that uh, there's clearly something wrong and then we'll add two more capacitors one to each phase You see it's still not there. We'll add one more and you see that the magic happens then Adding more after that doesn't seem to make it better But again, it does draw a lot more amperage and it's not really the uh, the right way to go. So Okay, so as you can see this capacitor this capacitor and this capacitor are Disconnected as well as all of them except for two on that one so we'll switch it back on. We will note the amperage draw is nine or 10 amps at idle. Swing that across the room, turn that off. And go over to here. Uh, I was playing around with various things. All right, crank it all the way back down. And I know there's a little sag in this, so I'm setting it about 20. Uh, and we're going to set the inches per minute at just under 200. I think that's good. Well, number one, this is only 130 uh, microfarads. So, you see how you never get that crackling, you get the spitting and sputtering, you never get that good crackling bacon sound. All right, we're gonna shut it off. We're gonna come back here and we're going to snap on two more capacitors. Snip those right on. And again, be super careful. This is the wrong way to do it because these are live, these are live, these are live, those are live. It's all hanging out. Uh, you know, do what I say, not what I do, okay? All right, so we'll go back around again. We'll flip it back on. We will check the amperage draw. And now we're at about 18 amps at idle. Dude among you might have noticed that that was actually just a little bit smoother but it's still crappy and it's still not not making a real weld by any stretch of the imagination so that was 180 microfarads and we did this in one of the tests in the previous video uh, but my whole setup is a little bit different now and it's wired with the proper wire so we're just going back over that just a little bit um, all right so now we got 240 microfarads which uh, is what I think the magic number is for this welder. We'll just snap it on. Uh, just drop that the floor. All right. So uh, it's clear that my welding settings are still wrong. That's still cold, but. What you could hear is that you can get that sustained snap and crackle out of it. That just that nice buzz. So we'll crank it up a little bit more. Let's 
see if we can't hit the magic numbers. You, you might say, well, you just went and changed something in your test setup, which means that it's not valid anymore. We'll shut it off. We'll come back here. We'll disconnect a couple of these guys. So now we're back to 180 microfarads. Nothing has changed. You saw the previous weld, nice and smooth like butter. You come back over here. the same settings this is taller and as I went along there was a little up oh, and then another up oh, whereas this had a much less hard of a time saying sustain sustain so and if I take off one more it'll get back to, to absolutely crappy again so the way to do it is you want something like this which does not look very in focus but that's what you want it should be nice and sunk down uh, the underside that you can't see very well will tell the tale that this has much better penetration than this. And actually, you'll see the, if you check the amperage draw while you're welding, you'll see that that goes up. So um, basically, I think for the 300 amp welder, uh, 240 microfarads per phase seems to be the magic number. That's what I'm gonna go for. Uh, it's kind of like, it's kind of like setting a balance between uh, what amperage you can output and burning your welder to the ground because it's wired up wrong. So that's the end result. 240 microfarads a phase for the CP300. For the CP200, I would start at 60 and add 60 at a time. I don't think you need more than 180 for that. And I think, um, I think 60 has been said to work, but I, I feel like that's light. 130 is probably, 130, 180 is where you want to be at. Again, I don't think this is an exact science by any means. I'm not sure, I'm not sure the methodology by which this works. You can read the PDF. Uh, at this point, I've, I've asked some people I know, various engineers in various fields, um, about what they think is happening and why it's happening, shown them the oscilloscope views, talked to them about my results, and haven't got a whole lot of information. Um, so uh, his original point about making a figure eight pattern of amperage through the coils, I, I got to go with that. I, I, I don't know any better than that at this point. Um, I, my gut feeling is, after doing some reading, is that by putting the, the, the capacitors in, and driving them the way you are, you're partially saturating the coil. And if I'm not mistaken, that lowers the resistance for these two coils and that allows them to pass the amperage they need to pass in order to weld. So is this middle coil part of the welding? Is it giving you power? I don't really know. Uh, is this just as good as running on three phase power? I can almost guarantee it's not, but, um, in some of my tests, I cranked it up all the way. I can uh, can do m a little more than 100% penetration in a uh, quarter inch plate with 035 solid wire, which is about all you can get out of it. So um, it, all you can get out of 035 wire in the best of circumstances. So I would say that for my purposes, this welder is perfectly fine. Uh, again, if you're a professional, don't waste your time. Uh, this is not, this is not, what I would want to run my reputation on, I guess. Um, but most of what I'm gonna be doing is welding old Land Rover frame and uh, such things like that, that are really, uh, you know, that's two millimeter is what the, the, the information I've read says. So that's like a two millimeter frame. So, you know, this is more than adequate. Um, the real reason to go for this upgrade, the real star of the show, I think, is this wire feeder. Um, there's a lot of things to like about it. Unlike your normal suitcase garbage 
well, not garbage, but your suitcase cheap uh, welder, like I got a Hobart Handler 140. This has gears so that the top and the bottom roller are driven. So the top one's not just, the top one's actually driven and not just spinning based on friction. So that's good. They're larger diameter rollers. So the contact patch, because the diameter is bigger, is gonna be better. Um, I did finally swap these out for feed rolls that are not ridged. These are 035 wire proper feed rolls. Here's what was in it. Um, so you can see it's a lot narrower of a groove and it doesn't have that sort of herringbone pattern, which I hope can be seen, but I'm not positive. Uh, the other thing is if you, if you can really look close, this one looks like it's full of junk and packed with stuff. And that's because when you use this on solid wire, it'll, it'll have a tendency to flake off small amounts of material that can cause a lot of problems with your, with your liner from what I've read. So just get the right ones. It's 50 bucks. You're going to buy it once. This is going to last as long as I need it to, especially since this has two grooves so I can flip it over and use the other side. This is not the last welder based video I'll be doing. Um, the, the, there will be a video in the future where I talk about this little number right here. So this unit could have had spot welding timer, a pre-flow, a post-flow, and a burn back. So, um, all those features are nice. You could go buy the boards. See, it shows you about the option boards. That's all very nice. Um, but I'm not going to. What I think I can do is I think that I can open this up, clean it out, because, wow, it is, it is grody in there. Uh, clean it out, and what I think that I can do is find a little switch and some potentiometers that fit in that hole, like a switch type potentiometer, um, and hook it up to an Arduino and give myself burn back spot. Burn back is nice because it'll leave the wire energized for just a little bit longer, and this has a definite tendency to leave a little ball on the end and uh, you don't want that uh, to happen. So that's what that'll fix. Spot welding will be nice because if I was ever welding like auto body panels with this, you know, it's a little bit heavy for that. But if I was, you can use a spot setting so that all of your little spot welds that you stitch together with are gonna be the same size, be nice and consistent. And that goes from, you know, quarter to two and a half seconds. So that's perfect. And then pre-flow and post-flow, which I don't know if I'd use them, but you know, if I've already gone down the rabbit hole and and I'm gonna do it, then I might as well add those in. I think what I can probably do is make a little case that attaches to the back of this for the Arduino, and then get a little power supply that ties into this that goes uh, from 24 volt AC to probably nine volt DC is what I'll run at. So that's another project coming up to give you all the features that the S22A could have come with. Uh, you know, because they're nice, but also because we can. So uh, thank you for watching. I think this is uh, theoretically practical, but perhaps a little more theory than it is practical. Uh, have a great day.